Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play this is my last letter, and here's the last thing I'll say. Welcome, everybody, to the first episode of a brand new podcast series. This is Schumacast, a podcast exploring the filmography of director Joel Schumacher. I am Noel Thingvall, and joining me is... Angel Tusa. Yeah, how you doing, Angie? I'm doing good. I'm both nervous and excited to be getting back into this whole regular podcast game again. <laughs> yeah, and it'll be interesting doing another director series because I'm just coming off of Masters of Carpentry where we went through all of John Carpenter and I wanted mm -hmm. to do someone else. And for some reason, Joel Schumacher just kept <laughs> springing to mind. Yeah, you know, you go from someone considered one of the great auteurs... But no, I mean, I think that's the thing about Joel Schumacher is that he has such a wide breadth of work in yeah. terms of the different things he's done that he really is worth exploring, even if people tend to know him as the bat nipple guy. Yeah, that's definitely what always sparked my interest because so much of my generation, you mentioned Joel Schumacher, they instantly go to Batman and Robin. Right, right. And it's like, that was like 20 years into a really varied career. Mm -hmm. So many hits, a few misses and all that stuff. Just a really interesting body of work. I think it's one of those things people don't even necessarily realize. I mean, I think they know he did Lost Boys. Yeah. But a lot of those films, they probably know the film, but they don't necessarily realize he's the one that directed it. I know I didn't. It's also interesting looking at his career is like, unlike Carpenter, where I had already seen like a good two thirds of his stuff. Mm -hmm. I've really only seen like a handful of Joel's movies. And it's like, I've heard about so many of these other ones. Like he was iconic in the Brat Pack era, you know, a lot of his thrillers and all that stuff. But I've never seen right. that many of them. Yeah. Thinking back on the ones you have seen, what, what is your kind of general impression of Joel? At least at this point, I don't feel like I can say that he has a set style or vision. He's always sort of struck me as like a studio's director in that he makes the piece that needs to be made and he does it well, but I can't look at it and go, oh, that's a Schumacher film, mm -hmm. you know, beyond the camp of the Batman ones, obviously. That's kind <laughs> of its own little breed. Yeah. And me, thinking back on his films, I think there's definitely a shared aesthetic, mm -hmm. especially after everything I explored in prep for this episode. I think there's <laughs> definitely a shared aesthetic, and we'll get into that in a minute. But there's always this kind of crispness, this coolness. Mm -hmm. I don't mean like cool in terms of like awesome and hip. I mean, this kind of chill <laughs> effect to a lot of his films. Mm -hmm. I mean, like Batman Forever and Batman and Robin are known for their flamboyant opulence. But when I think of Schumacher, right. I think more mood, more monotone and hmm. things are slightly subdued. And also with a bit of a dark edge to it. Right. There's a grimness to his films. Just thinking about the ones I have seen, I do think it seems like these days they set color palettes on films so easily. But, you know, yeah. you think about like Lost Boys off the top of your head and you're like, that's a very much black and red, dark kind of thing. And obviously Batman has the neon, but it's still very much a color palette that he's going for. So I don't know, I'm looking forward to noticing more details like that as we go through his whole work and start to see more patterns. Yeah, and that's something that's always left out to me too, is we talk about it a lot now in the days of digital color correction, where mm -hmm. it's even being talked about with Wonder Woman and the recent DC movies of everything has this kind of muted thing. It's either tinted blue or it's tinted orange and all that right. stuff. And I think back on Schumacher films and there's a lot of a shared scheme. Mm -hmm. It's a very muted, but it's still there. There's still color there but it's kind of muted it's everything has a similarity to it with the exception of stuff like the batman movies where he's like let's just make it as vibrant and black lights and neon and all that <laughs> stuff where to be fair is an interesting experiment it's him going completely against the mm -hmm. scheme that he's usually known for so that's gonna be something that i'm interested to explore where schumacher is someone who when i think of him i don't think of like shared themes or shared types of stories or, or types of characters but i think of a similar aesthetic Aesthetic. Right. 
And it's interesting, even just hearing interviews with him where he talks about how every time he made a film, he intentionally would want to make a film that's as completely different as the last film he made because he never wanted to get pegged into a hole. Hmm, cool. I can respect that. And especially being an openly gay director at the time, he very much never wanted to become stereotyped and wanted to have a wide variety of things he could do so he could do as many different kinds of movies as he could. So anything else you want to add before I jump into some biography? No, because I think the main thing is I'm looking forward to realizing the different things about his work that I probably never stopped to think about. And again, filling in the gaps for me, because there's so mm. much of his career I haven't seen. Like, I've seen less than half of his movies. Okay. So Joel Schumacher was born on August 29th, 1939 in New York City, initially growing up in Brooklyn. His father, a soda jerk, died when Joel was four. And after moving to Long Island, his mother spent most of her days out working. So he spent most of his free time going to movies at the Sunnyside Theater, which was right behind their apartment. By age seven, he knew he wanted to be a filmmaker, and he went so far as to build his own marionette theater and marionettes and even played a few birthday parties in the neighborhood. Aww. <laughs> And I have a really nice quote here from him. It was a tough neighborhood, but a good-hearted neighborhood in the long run. I was a wise ass, but underneath it all, I was lonely, terrified, disconnected, but not in the movie theater. I'd sit in the dark and those films reached out to me. When I travel and meet people that have seen my films, then talk to people about them, I hope I am part of this chain. I was this lonely person in the dark. Film reached out to me and I got lucky enough to make it. If my films reach out to anyone out there and make them laugh or cry or get scared or talk about something or affect them in some way, it's all a part of a chain. Film is very powerful, and even the angriest curmudgeon you know has <laughs> one film they love. <laughs> I like that. And that's been an interesting thing about going through like some of the interviews with him in prep for this show. He's a really fun guy to listen to. <laughs> he has a really good sense of humor. He's a great storyteller. He's someone I'd love to sit down and have lunch with. Yeah, he seems very easygoing. I mean, yeah. even when people were mocking him so badly and hating on those movies, he seemed to mostly take it in stride. Yeah. Even like Batman and Robin, people always keep pulling up the headlines. He's apologized for Batman and Robin, but you hear him talk about it. And he's like, he has very clear reasons why he <laughs> did what he did. And he's like, say la vie, he moved on and made other movies. Yep. So in the mid-60s, Joel studied at the Otis Parsons School of Design, graduating in 1965, the year his mother died. While studying, he worked as a window dresser for the Henry Bendel department store, which apparently was very noted for its window displays. And oh, okay. I sadly couldn't find any photos of his, but his were actually quite highly praised, and he even returned during the 70s to do some. Oh, wow. Okay. He later opened his own Madison Avenue boutique called Paraphernalia. <laughs> And then ended up designing clothing for Revlon. Hmm. Despite his rising success, Schumacher did spend much of the 60s heavily into sex and drugs, primarily speed. Hmm. So he went into fashion. Yeah. Even though he loved movies. Did you see anything as like why he went in that direction at first? From what I get is just art school. He just built okay. his own marionette theater and built his own marionette. So he had an eye for design. Sure. The sense I get, there wasn't much of a film scene in New York at that time. Okay. So if you wanted to do something creative, you go into art, you go into display, you go into fashion. Makes sense. Okay. Another great quote here. I've really done everything wrong that a human being can possibly do except murder someone, thank God. <laughs> Fast lane, drugs, you know. I'm a survivor of the 60s who stayed way too long at the party. I should have been dead 50 times before I was 18, 100 times by the time I was 25. I really thank God that I never hurt anyone while I was drunk and stoned because I certainly drove around the city when I was. Wow. So yeah, it was bad, but it reached a point in 1970 where he just realized his life was going down the toilet. Mm. And at age 30, he actually went to Central Park and buried his syringes. <laughs> a little ritual, I guess. Yeah, cleaned himself up and he decided to reboot things by going back to his childhood dream of filmmaking. Okay. He spent some time doing costumes and art direction for commercials before finally breaking into the film industry. And I got the whole story of that when we get to the first of the films. Okay. So any thoughts you have on kind of that interesting side loop that he had? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess to me, I guess the most interesting part of it is he was obviously doing artistic work, but then he also got entangled with the drug use and everything. Yeah. He used that reboot to not just clean up, but to also go towards something he kind of always wanted to do as a kid anyway. That's pretty neat. And he was 30, you said? Yeah, 30. Because, like, there's a lot of people that they reach 30 and they're like, oh, well, that's it. I'm not going to have a chance to do anything. Well, no, you can restart whenever you want, you know? 
And he was successful. I mean, he had his own boutique. He was literally mm-hmm. designing for Revlon, which was a huge company at the time. So, I mean, it's like he was successful. No, oh, yeah, sure. Probably wasn't a famous no name, but he was in the business. He was doing work. And that's mm-hmm. work that most people could be. That's their big contribution in life. And they're happy with that. Right. Yeah, no, it's interesting that he just kind of like pulled away. from. And to be fair, again, he returned. And even after he cleaned up and went into the film industry, he came back and did some more windows for that company. We'll get to some commercials that he did later in life for some of those companies well and doing costume design in film first i mean he was still obviously in a similar field just doing it for film yeah so that's going to lead us into the era of the 70s where joel schumacher was a costume designer for films and there are six films that he's credited as a costume designer an additional film that he's credited as a production designer though i suspect he did the costumes too for that Mm -hmm. So I watched through all of these films and I put together some Tumblr galleries that have all those images in them. And you can find those links in the show notes. Angie, you've looked over the stills. Is there anything that kind of leaps out to you in terms of the costumes that he did in terms of like a style or similar themes? Well, it's hard having not been alive in the 70s. Sometimes I'm like, okay, is that just like typical 70s clothing? Or is that what I think is typical 70s clothing because I've seen movies and (laughs) TV shows and that's, you know, obviously they may have been going a little more high fashion occasionally. Mm -hmm. There's some interesting colors for sure that I found in some of them. Last of Sheila, that had some really interesting designs like a sweater that was like yarn. Yeah. <laughs> like just different multicolored strands of yarn. Oh, you mean the one where it's kind of like all flared out? Yeah. Like, I guess some of it felt like average for the 70s, of course. But yeah, there was a couple where it was like, okay, I can see he was definitely pushing some interesting ideas and colors and designs into it. From having seen the films, usually the characters that are the most colorfully dressed are the characters who are like the most flamboyant. Makes sense. The really loud, humorous ones. Mm -hmm. Everything that I've seen of the 70s looks really ugly to me. (laughs) The 70s were kind of known for weird, muddy color combinations and fabrics and... A lot of contrast colors, yeah. yeah. Things not always fitting well. But everything I've seen from Schumacher, some of these outfits still look fashionable today. They're very cleanly tailored. The Mm -hmm. combinations of textures and colors are actually really nice on the eye. He loves a flared wingtip collar. Yes. (laughs) But that was pretty common for the era, too. (laughs) That was. And, you know, a lot of ascots and turtlenecks. He also liked a lot of layering where it's like you have a scarf beneath the shirt, beneath another shirt, beneath a jacket. And each (laughs) one is put together in a very nice way. Everything just looks kind of clean. Mm -hmm. But then if you ever had to do someone who's frumpy, like Prisoner of Second Avenue, Jack Lemmon spends a lot of that in his pajamas and in a ratty old (laughs) t-shirt. He knows how to make that look right, too. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm looking at the ones for interiors Mm -hmm. and nearly everybody is in like neutral colors. Yes, that's definitely a very color scheme movie. Yeah, okay. And there's that one character who wears some pretty bright dresses, but I'm guessing once again, that's like... That's the flamboyant character, flamboyant yeah. nature, yeah. Yeah. It's a very mood piece movie and she's the one who comes in and is all happy. <laughs> and everyone is like, why are you happy? <laughs> <laughs> you walked into the wrong film. Let us wallow in our misery. <laughs> Not to spoil too much of my thoughts on that movie. <laughs> And then, of course, you've got Sleeper, which is the sci-fi. Where he just got to cut loose. And especially there's a scene where it's a party full of future hipsters. (laughs) And everyone just has these bizarre... Like, there's one guy who's wearing a reverse swastika and Mm. a scarf that rabbis wear. Right, right. I think the necklace of black baby doll heads (laughs) is probably like... I was like, wait, what? Yes. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, once I took the still and I looked at it, I'm like, oh, is that really? And then I didn't quite get a good shot, but she also on the back of her afro just has this steel plate, (laughs) like just on the back of her head. It's weird. Why not? Yeah. (laughs) Sleeper is definitely the one where they were on a shoestring budget, but he just got to cut loose and do whatever he wanted. And Woody Mm kind of just let him. Yeah. And I mean, once again, it's like it's simple, but it works really well for what it is. And a lot of it is just really tailored white suits or solid Mm -hmm. black suits. And then I'm guessing the red are like soldiers or something. Yeah, those are the police force. Police force, yeah. Yeah. You gotta love the robots. (laughs) 
And they're perfect tuxedos. <laughs> Wait, yeah, which I think he said he literally just cut up hockey masks and stuff. <laughs> so anything else about it, you before I just kind of go in film by film? Um, no, uh, that's it. Okay. So our first one is Played As It Lays in 1972. And before I get to that, here's uh, another quote from Schumacher talking about his history and how this led him into the film industry. A friend of mine who was a TV commercial producer knew Dominic Dunn, who has now become a very successful novelist, but at the time he was a producer. His sister-in-law was Joan Didion, and he was producing a film called Play It As It Lays from her book that Frank Perry was directing, and I stalked him. (laughs) Because of my fashion background, they let me be the costume designer for 200 bucks a week on an independent movie. So that's how I started doing costumes and sets and then art direction and production design. And Joan DeDean and John Gregory Dunn made life really bearable the first years I was out there, very kindly invited me into their home for dinners. I met amazing people like Mike Nichols, Jack Nicholson, Roman Polanski, Bob Evans, The Silberts, Warren Beatty, and a lot of wonderful writers. I lived in a $150 a month apartment living hand to mouth, then would go to their house once a week for dinner, so they sort of got me through it. So, played as it lays... Basically, every argument you can make about, like, a pretentious indie art movie, this is a pretentious. <laughs> so, is that a poker reference? What is that? It's just kind of like whatever life throws at you. Yeah. It's directed by Frank Perry, who's done a lot of odd movies like The Swimmer, Diary of a Mad Housewife, Doc, Rancho Deluxe, and The Infamous Mommy Dearest. Mm. And it stars Tuesday Weld, Anthony Perkins, and Adam Warwick. Joan Didion, who he mentions in his story, her novel was a very popular book in the 70s. Okay. It's a story of an actress in Hollywood who's seeing two directors. She's just drunk all the time. Her life is a wreck. Her young daughter has been institutionalized with a behavioral disorder, which very much looks like autism, but they wouldn't have known that at the time. Right. She gets pregnant again, and one of the directors, because she doesn't know which is the father, one of the directors presses her to get an abortion. And it's just her life spiraling out of control, and it ends with her ultimately getting institutionalized herself. Mm-hmm. It's just a story about rich, vapid white people being sad. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And it's just these kind of boring scenes of everyone just kind of sitting around philosophically talking, like intercut with like these sudden flashes of her like driving down a road with a gun shooting every sign she passes. Is that supposed to be a dream sequence or is she actually doing it? No, she actually has a gun and likes driving down roads and shooting every sign she passes. Okay. Because she just likes hearing that ping of the bullet hitting the metal. All right. Here's an example of what the dialogue in this movie is like. Oh, no. (laughs) Tell me what matters. Long pause. Nothing. (laughs) Exactly what do you want? Long pause. Exactly. (laughs) Does the camera cut back and forth to their faces as that's happening? Oh, it would be great if it did. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's not a terrible, it's a well-made movie. It's really well shot. The Mm -hmm. cast is good. It looks nice. It's just really pretentious and kind of pat. Yeah, sounds like it. It's an interesting film for the period. What's interesting is there's so many of those films about like a male author or a male actor or a male filmmaker going through a midlife crisis. It's kind of interesting Mm -hmm. seeing a woman go through that. So she does get the abortion? Yes. And that sequence is actually done very nicely. And that's not really played as the reason why she has a breakdown. Well, that's good. It's just one of the things that happens in her life. And ultimately, it's like she doesn't even have like a full breakdown. It's just she stops caring about anything Mm -hmm. and she can't connect anything. Like it even gets to a point where one of her friends is literally committing suicide in front of her and she doesn't care. Wow. It's an interesting movie. What's interesting is most of these movies are all like Roger Ebert gave it four out of four. Hmm. And you can see how it was interesting at the time, but it's like done in a style that we've seen so many of, you know, the Garden State type movies. Right, right. Yeah. There's no real interest to go back necessarily. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of groundbreaking at the time, but it's like, yeah, but we've all done it now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's the kind of movie that if you've got a small budget, That's pretty much what you can make, and so many people Mm -hmm. have made it. And costumes, just a lot of rich people hanging out in beach homes and a (laughs) lot of ascots. Mm -hmm. So then the next one we have is The Last of Sheila from 1973. Most of these, I'm not going to have that many quotes from Joel. I only had a couple of them. Okay. So this one was directed by Herbert Ross, who was mostly known as a choreographer, but then became a director and did a lot of very famous movies like Goodbye, Mr. Chips, The Owl and the Pussycat, Play It Again, Sam, Funny Lady, The 7% Solution, The Goodbye Girl, Ninjinsky, Pennies from Heaven, Footloose, Hmm. The Secret of My Success, Steel Magnolias, My Blue Heaven, and and boys on the side. 
It's like a very long, very successful career. Yeah. The plot is like one of those 10 little Indian style murder mysteries where it's like everyone gathered on a yacht, where it's James Coburn is this eccentric producer who likes to throw these murder mystery night parties. And what everyone is gradually realizing is that everything here ties back to him trying to figure out who it was who killed his wife a year ago in a hit and run. Oh, okay. And the ensemble cast is made up of Richard Benjamin, James Mason, Joan Hackett, Diane Cannon, Raquel Welsh, and Ian McShane with hand puppets. I was like, yeah, this is the one that you sent me that <laughs> screenshot of with the hand puppets, huh? Young Ian McShane <laughs> with hand puppets. Yeah. They're all like Hollywood elites, like one's an actor, one's a screenwriter, a director, a manager, an agent. What's really interesting is this is the only film that was written by actor Anthony Perkins and Broadway composer Stephen Sondheim. Hmm. Okay. Who wrote it together when they were a couple back in the 70s, and they were known in Hollywood for throwing these elaborate murder mystery night parties. <laughs> and Herbert Ross, the director, was at a party once and was like, hey, if you write a script, I'll direct it. <laughs> So they did it on a lark, and I really liked it. This one's a really good movie. I don't know if you've ever heard of an 80s slasher film called April Fool's Day. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a much better film than April Fool's Day. It's kind of reminiscent of that where it's got a really good, sharp sense of humor. It's very snarky. There's not much suspense and tension at first. And even when they seemingly reveal what's happening, it just kind of rolls over. But that's because they're actually leading up for here's what really happened. <laughs> and I got to say, the last 20 minutes are absolutely fantastic. And I'm not going to okay. say a word about what happens in them. But Last of Sheila is a really fun movie that I really recommend tracking down. Is it out there easily or did you have to go digging for this one? Last of Sheila is indeed out on DVD. Okay, good. It's a film where everyone's an asshole. But it's fun because it's got a good <laughs> right, biting sense right. of humor. It's a very satirical look. I mean, like the previous film, Play It As It Lays, was vapid rich white people in Hollywood, but it was annoying because it took itself seriously. Right. This one has fun with the fact that it's all vapid rich white people in Hollywood being assholes. Just looking at the screenshots, you can almost see the sense of humor of it. Yeah. With some of their facial expressions and everything. Yeah. And again, as I said, Ian McShane with hand puppets. At some point in the movie, someone tries to use those hand puppets to murder someone. <laughs> that I'm looking at that picture of him in that long sleeve blue shirt. Yeah, or yeah. Maybe it's a layered thing where it's got like just the big image. I'm just like, that is an interesting choice. No, I think that's just one of those odd 70 shirts. It kind of makes me think of like something Mork would have worn. Well, what's interesting about his character is everyone comes from elite. Everyone is a Hollywood upper crust person. Mm -hmm. He's a criminal, so he comes from more of a street background. Okay. So he's kind of got a looser, more casual way of dress, even though he can be chic at times. So that is an interesting character bit. And then the blonde must be the, like the one with that sweater I was talking about earlier. Like she must be the really wild one. Oh yeah. And that's Diane Cannon. She is fun. I mean, she still acts and stuff today. She is a mm -hmm. really fun actress. She's actually going to be the star of the Virginia Hill story, which we're going to be covering in yes. the next episode. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Because yeah, she's got that. And then she's got those crazy pants. Yes. Those jeans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those great 70s patchwork hippie jeans. Mm-hmm. I think my mom had some like that. Not quite like that. But Diane yeah. Cannon, you should look her up because she's one of those actresses that you don't realize you've seen her in a bunch of stuff. Until right. You... I remember that just from preparing for Virginia Hill, yeah. like I looked her up and I was like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So then we get to Bloom and Love, which is also 1973. Bloom and Love was written and directed by Paul Mazursky, who was a big character actor. He's in a bunch of stuff. He wrote and directed the films Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, Alex in Wonderland, Harry and Tonto, An Unmarried Woman, Down and Out in Beverly Hills, Moon Over Parador, Enemies, A Love Story, Scenes from a Mall, and The Pickle. And also, he was the developer and head writer back in the day of The Monkees. Oh, uh, okay. Cool. And Bloom and Love stars George Siegel, Susan Anspach, and Chris Christopherson. And I hate this fucking movie. Wow. <laughs> Bloom and Love is about the depressing midlife crisis of a divorce attorney whose wife divorces him after he cheats on her. Well, imagine that. And then, you know all those horror film and thrillers about women being stalked by their ex-husbands? Mm-hmm. Imagine that from the male's point of view as an endearing comedy. Hmm. I mean, like, he is following her, mapping her daily routine, hopping her fence and looking in her window at night, befriending her boyfriend. It's one of those films where as I'm watching it, I want to give this film the benefit of the doubt because I'm hoping it gets to the point where he learns to let go and move on. Right. Because he keeps going further and further in. 
And a large part of the film is him talking about his issues and talking about, you know, we've been through bad breakups. I've been through bad breakups. Yeah. I can recognize a lot of the issues he's going through, but he keeps going in the wrong direction with it. Right, right. And I wanted to give it the benefit of the doubt. And in the last half hour, he throws his ex-wife to the floor and rapes her. Wow. And let me guess, they don't really present it. Oh, they, they like, play it as rape. She's like shouting. She's, they do? Okay, so it is appropriately horrifying at least? Oh, yeah. And the whole scene plays out. Wow. The 70s. She yells, he raped me. A guy runs in, decks him in the face. And then she becomes pregnant. And because they always wanted children and couldn't conceive, this is what ultimately brings them back together in the end. And they live happily mm. ever after. Yeah. Wow. I, I hated this fucking movie. I don't blame you. Four out of four stars from Roger Ebert. Like, <sighs> what? I know. You know, I mean, like, I'm just saying the 70s because there was like Last House on the Left, I Spit on Your Grave. But at least those were like revenge horror films yeah. that kind of had a point. But why? Ugh. That's how he wins her back. No. And it's like the entire film had been building to this scene where she's like, look, I know you're still trying to get back with me. I just don't love you anymore. And that's when he throws her to the ground and her. And it's like, that is so completely against the tone of the film leading up to it. Right. And yet the film then tries to go back to that. No, yeah. like, And then to go from that of like, no, but it's okay because see, he knocks her up. And then so she's got to be with him. Yeah. No, honey, you got a child that you wanted. Go find a man who's actually worth a shit. And let him be the father. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's a two-hour movie. For the first hour and a half, I'm like, you know, I have some issues here and there, but it is well-written. There's some good humor, some interesting character stuff. Mm -hmm. But you took it in the exact opposite direction of where this was ultimately going. Right, right. And then tried to recover, and you can't. And it's interesting, like, looking at the reviews from the 70s, all mm -hmm. loved it. And looking at the reviews of the movie nowadays, because it is out on DVD, everyone is just like, oh, no, no, <laughs> no. The times change, fortunately. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, wow, how was that even a thing at that time that you could do? Yeah, I don't know. It's something. Yeah. And then that brings us to Sleeper. And before I get into the movie, I've got a nice big chunk of Schumacher quotes here okay. from this and how Woody Allen was, was a big, I mean, we all think what we think about Woody Allen nowadays. I think it too. Yeah. But he, I mean, he was one of the major figures in film back in the 70s. And it's kind of interesting right. how he was very influential in Schumacher going the direction he did. Okay. In Christmas of 1971, Woody hired me to do the costumes on Sleeper. We made it for $2 million. It was like a high school play. We were up in the Rocky Mountains, everyone pitching in. We had no money. The robot costumes were mostly rented. I made the mass out of hockey masks. The cars were old Volkswagens with a fiberglass shell on top. It was a thrill to be working with Woody. I was a busboy in the village in my teens, used to see Woody do his stand-up act there. We're still very close friends, and he was the first and only director I ever worked with who encouraged me and believed that I would become a director. Coming from someone that brilliant, that was a very important moment in my life in 1973. The dream seemed so far away, and for someone like that to say, you've got it, you're going to do it, it meant the world to me. He encouraged me to be a director, but said that first I had to write. He said, you're clever and funny, I think you can do it. He said, the most important thing about writing is that you must finish it and people must read it. Take a good look at this industry. There's a handful of geniuses that have been touched by the gods. The rest of them, if they can do it, you can do it, and you can do it better. Be bold, take risks, follow your own instincts, listen to other people only when you really believe in your gut that they're right. Get a great cast, get a cinematographer who isn't jealous that you're the director. Get an editor that's not jealous that you're the director. You can do it. <laughs> but no, it's interesting that Sleeper was such a weirdly experimental movie and that mm -hmm. Woody got Schumacher to start writing scripts. Those scripts then ultimately led to him becoming a director. So Sleeper is written and directed by Woody Allen. I won't go into his credits because he's Woody Allen. He's one of the legends in the industry. Right. I have my issues with Woody. I think he's an incredibly talented filmmaker and writer and a gifted physical comedian, but I don't really like him as a person. Granted, I don't know him as a person. All I know are the stories about him as a person, and they're not good stories. Right. Especially if you were a child of his, or not even one of the child of his, but the child of someone he was in a relationship. Yeah. In which case, you're probably the wife of his. <laughs> God damn you, Woody. <laughs> Sorry. Even when I saw like my first Woody Allen movies as a kid, I'm like, there's some really neat stuff in here, but he's just kind of skeevy. Mm. I just was never comfortable around Woody on screen. And that's never <laughs> gone away. 
Sleeper is a really good movie. It's a really sharp guy. It's a clarinet player goes in to get an ulcer treatment and wakes up 200 years later after he was accidentally frozen and finds this future dystopia where human experiences are all bizarre demolition manny type stuff and finds that there's this whole resistance and underground movement and what nobody realizes is that the great leader of this dystopia was actually killed in an accident a couple of years ago and all that's left is his nose. <laughs> And so there's this big plot to try to clone him. And there's literally a bit where Woody Allen is like holding a gun and holding the nose and I'll shoot the nose, you know. And <laughs> it's a weird comedy of just going through the future, a lot of social commentary. And it's very much the predecessor to Futurama and Idiocracy. Hmm. When I read the synopsis, I was like, that sounds a lot like Idiocracy. <laughs> yeah, it's someone goes to the future and they're kind of not the best representations of the past and they're in a future that's not the best representation of the future. <laughs> and he's kind of an idiot. They're like, we have very limited records of that era. Can we show you some pictures? And it's like every picture he's like getting wrong. That's Charles de Gaulle. He was a famous French chef. <laughs> it's a funny movie. It is. But I mean, it's mm -hmm. Woody Allen and your mileage will always vary on Woody Allen and your comfort level with Woody Allen. And, mm -hmm. and he's making rape jokes and calling things retarded and different times mm. and Woody Allen. Right. There's a lot of stuff that's good in it. Diane Keaton is great in it. The film looks great. I think Joel Schumacher's costumes are wonderful in it. I would love to see yeah. him do something else along that vein. So let me ask my question. Mm -hmm. I just remember sometime in the 80s, I think my parents were watching. It was definitely a Woody Allen movie. There's like a scene where I think the girl's like, oh, let's have sex. The Orgasmatron. Yes. That is this movie? Yes. Where they go into the booth. Okay. Because I was young enough that I didn't really understand sex to begin with. And I remember like asking my parents and them trying to explain to me <laughs> exactly <laughs> what was going on. Well, they should have shown you Woody Allen's earlier film, Everything You Wanted to Know About Sex. <laughs> Right. Where he's literally running through a field with a giant inflated breast. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I actually have a memory of this movie. <laughs> that specific scene and nothing else. So when I saw, like, the pictures and I saw him as the robot, I'm like, that looks vaguely familiar to me. I think I've seen this. And it's interesting because it was a very visually iconic movie of the 70s. A lot of the imagery mm -hmm. carried on. And it's interesting how much of that was Joel Schumacher. Mm, yeah. And how even before he started directing, here's a film that he's having a visual impact on. Right. Again, this is going to be where it's curious going into his own films and what is his aesthetic going to be like carrying on. Mm -hmm. Granted, just add neon lights and black, <laughs> black light and you get Batman. <laughs> it's one of those ones where it's like, it all depends on how you feel about Woody Allen. Yeah. I can watch Woody Allen movies. I don't really like to at the moment. I will when he's dead. That's kind of how I feel. Is I haven't watched a ton of his stuff. The stuff that I have watched, I remember enjoying, but given everything that we know now, I'm just not really yeah. feeling the urge to go see any more. The thing is, I've actually seen more of his early movies than I have his Me later too. era ones. Like his later era ones are more just dialogue heavy comedies around New York and stuff like that, or the English countryside recently. Yeah. But like his early films were really visually experimental. I mean, like they were similar stuff to like what the monkeys was doing with like these mm -hmm. big, weird, sped up set pieces, open fields, running around, editing tricks, almost like playing on old silent movies at times. Mm -hmm. His films are really interesting. Again, I think Woody Allen is a genuinely talented person. He's one of those frustrating geniuses where I really don't like him, but damn it, he's so good. <laughs> right. Then we get to the wonderful classic, The Killer Bees, a 1974 ABC TV movie of the week. I have to apologize for any photos from The Killer Bees. The copy that I have is a very muddy copy of a copy of copy. <laughs> Well, being a TV film, they usually don't get too great releases, if at all. That's kind of a bummer because he was a production designer, which meant he also did designs for like the locations and set pieces and all that stuff, and you can barely mm -hmm. see them. I have a couple of shots from inside where all the big wine casts are, and you can barely see them. It looks moody, but maybe it's just the bad quality of the film. I don't know. <laughs> oh, it's in a mood. I don't think it's a scary one. <laughs> Killer Bees, it's a really low-budget B-movie by Curtis Harrington. Curtis Harrington is not a very good filmmaker, but he's a filmmaker I've oddly seen a lot of his films and have a weird soft spot for. Partially, it's because I randomly got a DVD of one of his films, not even knowing who he was. And on the film was like an hour-long interview with his entire career. And I'm like, 
this is a horrible, forgettable movie, but man, this guy sounds really charming and interesting. <laughs> so I like always had a weird soft spot for his films, and I've seen a whole bunch of them, and none of them are that good. <laughs> <laughs> he did weird films like Picnic, Night Tide, Voyage to the Prehistoric Planet, Queen of Blood, How Awful About Alan, What's the Matter with Helen, the wonderfully titled, I love this title, Who Slew Auntie Rue? <laughs> The Cat Creature and Ruby. So a lot of those sound like sci-fi original movies before they were <laughs> sci-fi original movies. They were kind of more like the uh, Hallmark original. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of those were in the Baby Jane era of let's just make more of those. Mm -hmm. In fact, how awful about Alan and What's the Matter with Helen were written by the guy who wrote What Around Baby Jane. Yeah, okay. It's a whole other podcast I can get into because I've actually read all that guy's <laughs> work too. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, his films are, they're not very good. They're cheap, but there's this weird charm. He gets good cast together. There's occasional moments in them. And this star, not Eddie Albert, but Edward Albert. There's a difference. Kate Jackson and legendary silent film actress Gloria Swanson in one of her last roles. Hmm. It, oh man, this is a weird film to try to describe. Okay, <laughs> so a young woman and a young guy are in love. They're engaged. She's pregnant. And he's finally bringing her back to the family vineyard to meet the family and it's a weird eccentric vineyard who shuns guests and doesn't like the fact that he's marrying outside the town. And the vineyard is known for the honey sweetness of its wine because it has bees everywhere. All right. And these are bees that have formed a psychic connection <laughs> with the elderly matron of the family, played by Gloria Swanson. And there's literally scenes where they talk this very over-the-top flamboyant silent film actress into putting hundreds of bees on her. Wow. And she's actually playing it really well and apparently had a lot of fun with it. <laughs> well, that's good. But then she actually dies of a heart attack when she finds out that the woman is pregnant. Oh, Lord. And the bees go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> And it ends with them forming a new psychic bond with the woman who is now welcomed into the family. I don't know if the shots conveyed it, but yeah, there's a whole scene where she's in the beehive encrusted attic and actually becomes the one with the bees. Oh, that's that last one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, oh, it's a movie. <laughs> I wish I could see it better, but there's some really nice design work. These were shot on location, so it's not like they built sets, so it's all just dressing the location. But mm. he does some nice stuff with like the arrangement of the photos and wallpaper. There's some nice archways, a nice placement of plants. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a nice look to things, better than a film like this probably deserved. <laughs> What's interesting is most of the films he's making are like very prominent films with A-list directors of the period. Again, most of the films were like four or four stars from Roger Ebert, yeah. like big prominent films. And then he did this really cheap, crappy TV movie, <laughs> The Killer Bees. I'm wondering if maybe this like shot earlier in his career when he was still kind of more struggling. Maybe so. I couldn't find any quotes from him on The Killer Bees. I would love to ask Joel Schumacher about The Killer Bees. <laughs> He'd probably be like, wait, what? <laughs> There's a scene where Gloria Swanson has this one prop that looks exactly like it came out of Sleeper because it has to have been a Joel creation. She suddenly holds up this glass and steel bee. And it's like, you're looking at it, it's like, what is this weird little bee thing? And then she just mm -hmm. pulls up the wings and dips in a spoon and it's a honey dish. <laughs> it's literally like this glass and steel bee to serve honey in. Why not? It's weird. I tried to get the best photos. I even cropped them so I could try to highlight it as best as I can. But man, are yeah. those photos blurry. <laughs> I need to ask Joel Schumacher, so what about that bee serving dish? Where did you find it? Did you make it? <laughs> <laughs> Killer Bees is, if you just want like a really shitty 70s movie, it's like a fun mystery science theater type movie. Mm. The thing about Schumacher's career, we won't get into it too much here because we're going to get into it in upcoming episodes. While he was working as a costume designer is when he wrote his first two spec scripts, Car Wash and Sparkle, and while those sold and kind of danced around the industry before they were ultimately directed, no one would let him direct the movies. However, the scripts were good enough that a content producer at NBC offered to give him two TV movies to write and direct. And that's when we're going to get Virginia Hill, which came out the same year as Killer Bees. And Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill would not happen for another five years in 1979. Mm. And between that is when Sparkle and Car Wash were produced and The Wiz came out. So it's interesting that he wrote these two films first that didn't come out until after he had directed his first movie. And it's while he's directing and writing movies that he's still doing costumes. Mm -hmm. That brings us to our last two movies. In 1975 is The Prisoner of Second Avenue. And this is based on a play by Neil Simon, the famous guy who wrote The Odd Couple. Mm, okay. And other stuff like The Out-of-Towners. He was a huge writer in the 70s. 
And this was directed by Melvin Frank, who's been making films since the 40s. And this was actually one of his last ones. And Melvin Frank did films like Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House, White Christmas, The Court Jester. He wrote A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. And his last film was The Howie Mandel Walks Like a Man. And it stars Jack Lemmon and Anne Bancroft. And it's just about a couple in New York who just fall on hard times when he loses his job and they get robbed and they're trying to figure it out. And ultimately she goes to work and starts making money, but they're still struggling. And he goes through an emotional breakdown because he feels like he's not contributing anything. And It's just one of those films about just a couple in New York on hard times. Yeah, it definitely sounds like a typical like stage play yeah. of that era. Yeah, it's very much like a stage play where it's like you get four long sequences and they occasionally break it up with a few bits filmed on the street. It's a very funny movie. It's a hilarious movie. It's got a bit of a dark edge to it because, I mean, it does deal with an actual like mental breakdown and him getting help and treatment for it. But it's a really funny movie. It's sharply written. The couple are great. Jack Lemmon and Anne Bancroft are great in it. It's also interesting because F. Murray Abrams, this was one of his first movies as a cab driver, and it's also one of the first movies of Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, I saw you had that one Sylvester Stallone image there. Yeah, and he's just a young guy who Jack Lemmon runs into, and then Jack Lemmon thinks this guy stole his wallet, and he chases him down and takes the wallet from the guy and only realizing, oh, I left my wallet at home and I just mugged a kid. <laughs> So it's Jack Lemon in a foot race and fight against Sylvester Stallone, which he wins. <laughs> Prisoner Second Avenue is a fun movie. It, what's interesting is it's filmed in the 70s. It feels like a movie made in the 60s. It's shot in a very old style where it's like just a lot of wide shots, not very many close-ups. It doesn't cut much. It's filmed very much like a stage play. But I mean, it's a good movie. It's a fun movie. Cool. And then we finally get to interiors. And this is a few years past. I'm wondering if he maybe just did this as a favor to Woody Allen, because this is the last film he was a costume designer for. It's like three years after Prisoner of Second Avenue. And again, this would have been the same year that Wiz came out. So he would have been working on that too. Okay, yeah. It's another Woody Allen movie, but two hallmarks. It is the first Woody Allen movie that Woody Allen does not appear in. And it's the first Woody Allen movie that's a drama. Okay. It's a melodrama about three sisters who are not only kind of struggling with their own dissatisfaction with their lives, but their conflicted thoughts over their mother, who just keeps sinking into more destructive bouts of depression because their father is divorcing her and is ultimately gets to a point where he's met and is marrying another woman. That's the woman in the red dress. Oh, okay. And the thing is, their mother is a very unpleasant, very toxic person. So they're like, we feel bad because she's our mother, but she always treats us like shit. So we don't know if we feel bad and we're happy for our dad because this other woman's really fun. Mm. Except for the one sister who's like, no, mom, this other person, no. <laughs> <laughs> the film is, you would hate it with your pacing issues. <laughs> well, I don't know, because it's a drama. It's very much of like the Kubrick style drama where very long, slow, quiet scenes, people standing at windows, looking at waves, long stretches where there's nothing happening except like a sad person alone in the middle of a room. Mm -hmm. It's very much his tribute to Ingmar Bergman, who was a very big European director that he was a fan of, and also the writings of Vladimir Nabokov. Just looking at the images, it strikes me as the kind of thing, like if I was feeling tired on a Sunday afternoon, you know what I mean? Like there are certain times when like that kind of pacing is okay for me, if I'm in the right mood for it. The thing is, it's a beautifully made movie. I mean, it's gorgeously shot mm -hmm. and the natural lighting is great. I mean, as you pointed out, the costumes are all very neutral, very muted colors, but they're all kind of mm -hmm. synchronized. Like everything is like a pale pink or everything is like a pale tan, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a very striking film to watch. The main problem is the story and the character studies just aren't really that interesting. Mm. It's like if you took a typical melodrama and shot it like a Stanley Kubrick movie, it's still a typical melodrama. <laughs> <laughs> and the dialogue, and I don't know if this is just because it was his first time writing for drama. The thing about Woody Allen's writing is his dialogue always has a kind of singular voice to it. Yeah. That works well for the comedies. But in the drama here, it still has that voice. And so there's a lot of times where it feels like it's setting up for a punchline that never happens because it's serious now. Mm -hmm. So it's weird. It's not a film that fully works, but it's not a bad film. It was quite interesting to watch. The performances are great. It's just there's not much to the story. And it's very introspective, but it's not really actually analyzing or presenting anything. It's just kind of stuff happens, shot beautifully. Right. It's a very well-made movie. 
it just didn't connect with me as much as I hoped it would. It was in, it actually does make me want to see some of Woody's other movies, like Hannah mm-hmm. and her sisters and all stuff. And the thing is, Woody writes really great women when he's not writing them to sleep with his character. Yeah. Which he does in every film that he appears in. Except for his most recent ones where he finally is like, okay, I'm the character's grandfather. You know? He's finally facing it. Huh? I mean, I just remember when he started making movies with Scarlett Johansson. I'm like, oh no, as her father. Okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. <laughs> any thoughts or questions you have on any of these movies before we move on? So to recap, you got one really strong recommend. Yes, for Last of Sheila. And then another recommend for Prisoners of Second Avenue, huh? Yeah, yeah. And that's not like a huge recommend. It's a fun yeah. old school comedy. Mm-hmm. And then Interiors, I think, is an interesting film that we're checking out. And Sleepers, again, it's yeah. your mileage will vary on Woody Allen, but it's a well-made film for what it is. Right, yeah, those two come with a disclaimer, right? The good thing about Interiors is you don't have to see Woody Allen. Yeah. That makes it a little easier. <laughs> and, oh boy, Skip Bloom in Love. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. I'm glad I took that bullet so you don't have to. I'll say thank you for the entire audience. Thank you. <laughs> Killer Bees is shit, but it's fun shit. (laughs) It's shit with a charm. And then Played As It Lays, I think, is a film that will interest people. There's people who would be interested in that film. I'm just not one of them. Right, sure. I'm not Ryan Kelly. (laughs) Do any of these leap out as ones that you'd be interested in checking out? Definitely, from what you're saying, I'm interested in those two. I'm like Jack Lemmon in general, mm-hmm. so I'm interested in Prisoners of Second Avenue from that perspective, and I love The Odd Couple, you know? And then Last of Sheila, like, so just looking at the pictures, the characters look entertaining. It looks like a quirky kind of thing, so yeah, I'll probably be looking for those two. And then, yeah, the Woody Allen ones, I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> we'll wait till he's passed. Right. So with Joel, do we want to just kind of roll down a list of what the films are that we're going to be covering and if we'd seen them before, if we have any like particular striking memories of seeing them or... Sure. So in 1974, he had his debut at Virginia Hill. Is that one you're familiar with? I had not heard of it until this. Same here. And again, I think that one and Amateur Night are TV movies, so it'll still be a Mm -hmm. while until we get to his first theatrical. And then we get Sparkle, which he wrote... I think I remember when like the remake came out. Yeah. And I remember hearing about the remake. I didn't realize it was based on the original work from the 70s, though. And the remake, I think that was Whitney Houston's last movie. I know it's one that came out right around the time she passed away. Right, right. So that got a lot of buzz. And then one that I'm really interested in, I've never seen before, Car Wash. I've at least seen a lot of clips from it if I haven't watched it all the way through. It sounds like a great cast, and I know it was a big popular movie at the time. Mm -hmm. Like George Carlin's got a big scene in it, if I remember correctly. So then we get to The Wiz, the big adaptation of the play based on Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. I know I saw that one as a kid. I may have back then. I don't have too many memories. I mean, like, obviously I know of it, but Mm -hmm. I don't remember specifically watching it. I know when I recently, I didn't watch the whole thing, but I saw a chunk of it on TV like last year. And there was one scene that I'm like, oh my God, I remember the nightmares (laughs) I had from this scene. (laughs) And then we have his second film that he directed, Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill. Is that one you'd ever heard of? No, no. Neither had I, and that's one of his more obscure ones. We were almost going to skip that one until I finally found a copy. Okay. And then we get to his very first theatrical film, The Incredible Shrinking Woman, Mm -hmm. which that one, again, is one I know I saw as a kid. I remember certain images. I seem to recall it used to come on TV a lot. Yeah. And so, yeah, I know I watched it back then, and I remember like her in a rocking chair. Yeah, where it's like a big oversized one. Yeah, like I remember liking it as a kid, but I remember very little about it. It's like I have a lot of childhood memories of like big oversized sets and props. Mm Mm-hmm. Speaking of Sleeper, there's a whole bit where he goes to steal food and the farms there grow like gigantic bananas and strawberries. And (laughs) there's a whole scene where he steals like gigantic fruit and they're just sitting there in the woods eating like a giant celery stick. (laughs) (laughs) So obviously Joel could do that. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then we get to DC Cab. It's certainly one I've heard of. I don't think I've ever seen it. Yeah, it's another one that is often like mentioned hand in mouth with Car Wash because mm-hmm. again, he got the job for DC Cab because of Car Wash. And it's another one that I'm going to be very interested to see just because it's a really neat cast and a really kind of interesting concept for a movie. Right. 
And then there's one that we might have to skip. We'll see. Or at least hold it till later. We have the TV series Codename Foxfire that he created, Mm -hmm. where he didn't write or direct it. He just created it as is his concept. Charlie's Angels with Victoria's Secret Supermodels. (laughs) (laughs) If we find it, we'll cover it, you know, even if we have to do it out of order. But it's hard right now. (laughs) And then we get to like the big Brat Pack classic St. Elmo's Fire. That's one of those movies where it's like, I know that title immediately. I can't tell you what it's about. I guess because it was popular at the time, but I was probably still too young to actually see it. I haven't been doing the dates. Yeah, so this would have been 85. I would have been three. I know it's a big hallmark of the Brat Pack generation, but it's not one of the ones I've seen. I was always more just the John Hughes movies. Right. And then we get the TV movie, which he didn't write or direct, but he produced. We only have like three films that he produced that we are including. And this is the first one, Slow Burn, which I know is a noir with Eric Roberts. Okay. Then we get to The Lost Boys. Have you ever heard of The Lost Boys? No. Tell me about this small little indie film. Um, (laughs) The funny thing, I guess, for me is that I fell in love with Bill and Ted. Mm -hmm. And then I was digging for other movies that Alex Winter and Keanu Reeves had been in. (laughs) So that was actually how I first saw Lost Boys. And of course, Alex Winter really just has a supporting role. I'm not sure he might have like two lines. (laughs) And is Keanu also uncredited as the dog boy? (laughs) Not in this one. (laughs) But so that was my first experience with Lost Boys. But I'm a big vampire fan in general. So I'm excited to watch that one again. And I've never seen it. You've never seen it at all, really? I've never seen it. Okay. It's one of those weird ones that I've always kind of held out on Mm because, you know me, I collect novelizations. The novelization for that one is kind of infamous as a collectible and it's very hard to get. Yeah, okay. I've always wanted to read it. It's by an author who I've really enjoyed some other books by. And Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to because I also really like the screenwriters and I don't know, it just has something I've always wanted to get to and I never have. Well, that'll be fun. I get to be the veteran for once. Yes. (laughs) Yes. And then we get to, this is 1989, I Would Have Been Seven, which is the perfect age for a (laughs) Ted Danson rom-com, Cousins. That's once again, it sounds vaguely familiar, but I don't think I saw it. This is the one that we're going to have a fun time trying to find a guest for. (laughs) Hey, want to do Cousins? Hello? (laughs) And then we get Flatliners, which I know is another of the late generation Brat Pack movies. Mm. And I know that's like early Julia Roberts. Okay. I don't think I've ever seen that one. Same here. I know that's another one if it has a real solid cult following. It's a really interesting Mm -hmm. premise, but it's not one that I've seen. Yeah. And then we get to Dying Young, the lovable romance about cancer, (laughs) which again, I've never seen. Yeah, never. Then we get to an interesting one where Beverly Hills 90210 was super popular. So Aaron Spelling tried to get lightning in a bottle twice, and we got 2000 Malibu Road. Mm -hmm. Schumacher was the producer of, the co-creator of, and directed all existing six episodes of. And we are going to watch all six episodes of this primetime soap opera. All right. (laughs) Starring Drew Barrymore. Well, I like Drew Barrymore a lot, so... (laughs) Then we get to another one that I know has a cult following, but I've never seen Falling Down. Yeah, that's a movie that's been recommended to me multiple times, but I still haven't seen it yet. And I know it's one of those ones that comes out every time the political climate is kind of of that same type because it's a very political movie. Yeah. And I know like in recent year, it started to make a comeback again to the point where they've been talking about a remake. And I'm like, mm. well, let's see what this is like. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing Joel, I trust it to be interesting. Right. And then we get to, this would have been 1994 when I was 12. I think this was Mm -hmm. the first Schumacher film that was a big one for me. And I know I saw it in theaters and that's The Client. Yes. I'm pretty sure I did too. But it also kind of merges in my mind with a lot of the other thriller Grisham movies of the time period. So like, I can't tell you a whole lot about it, but I do kind of remember. I know I definitely saw it. I think part of the reason why I connected was it's a legal thriller from a kid's point of view. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is this kid who doesn't understand the legal system and they're trying to explain it to him. And so it has that accessibility if you watch it when you're young. And it's like, it's not meant to be Mm -hmm. a kid's movie, but it has this kid's point of view to it. I think that's why when I was like 12, I'm like, oh, this movie's awesome. <laughs> and then of course, I know that was a big hit and led into this string of films that he had in the 90s because then we get to Batman Forever. Mm-hmm. 
which, uh, again, I saw that one in theaters. Yeah. I mean, that movie, I really fell in love with Batman Returns. Mm -hmm. And I was immensely into Batman the Animated Series, where my favorite character was Dick Grayson. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So just the idea that they were going to make a Batman movie and Robin was going to be in it was just the most exciting thing. It was probably the movie I was the most looking forward to at that time. And at the time, I loved it. We'll see if I still feel that way. (laughs) It's interesting with Batman Forever and Batman and Robin is that Batman and Robin kind of made people change their mind about Batman Forever. Right, right. It's kind of like how a lot of people really liked Phantom Menace until the next one came out and everyone like kind of reappraised. Right, yeah. Because I remember I really liked Batman Forever too. and But again, Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it in a long time now. I know I had it on video, so I probably saw it up until around 2000. Yeah, I think last time I watched it was when the last Nolan Batman film came Mm. out and I did the marathon. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And then Batman and Robin, oddly enough, plays on TV more than Batman Forever does. So I've seen chunks of that more recently. That's interesting. Okay. So between the Batman and Robins, we have two other films. We have The Babysitter, which is another one of the ones he produced. Does that have Alicia Silverstone in it? I know there was The Babysitter and there was The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. Right. There was Poison Ivy. There was that whole glut of like beautiful Mm -hmm. teenager works her way into a family and then starts killing her from the inside out. I don't know where this falls into that. If it's the one with Alicia Silverstone, I might have seen it. It is Alicia Silverstone. With Carrie Elius? No, Jeremy Ludden and J.T. Walsh. Oh, okay. Okay. I think I saw it. (laughs) My memory is clearly a little blurry on this, but you know, it was a long time ago, so. And then I never made the connection that Schumacher was a producer on this, and then she appears in Batman and Robin. Mmm. Yeah. I'll have to look, see if there's any stories behind that. Okay. She was kind of the it girl of the time, so it might just be a coincidence. I miss Alicia Silverstone. (laughs) All we see of her are her PETA campaigns. (laughs) So yeah, and then there was A Time to Kill, which was the other big Grisham one he did. Right. I'm pretty sure I saw that one too. That one I didn't at the time. I'd never have. So that'll be interesting to explore though. Mm -hmm. And I am going to be reading the book. So let's read John Grisham for the first time since Skipping Christmas. (laughs) Which is still the only John Grisham novel I've ever read. Really? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) And then we get to Batman and Robin, which definitely left an impression. Yeah, I remember not liking the tone of it then, like not feeling like it wasn't quite right. And that'll be interesting to re-explore because my memory is there's not really that much difference between Batman Forever and Batman and Robin, and yet it kind of works in one film. It'll be interesting to kind of look at them side by side. Yeah. And then we should also point out that at one point when we were discussing this project, one of the names that I threw out there, even though I knew we weren't going to use it, was Beyond the Bat Nipples. <laughs> right. And the funny thing is, is that even when we passed on it, someone else completely independent of us has started his own <laughs> Joel Schumacher blogging project called, called Beyond, Beyond the, the Bat, Bat Nipples. <laughs> so we salute you, Beyond the Bat Nipples <laughs> blogger. <laughs> We were thinking alike for at least a moment. (laughs) Yes. I actually still have his site bookmarked and we'll be starting to read through some of his posts. I just haven't yet gone beyond the bat nibbles because I wanted (laughs) to not spoil myself for my own journey beyond the bat nibbles. (laughs) <laughs> we'll get there. But I mean, yeah, I think the reason why we didn't go with that also is because that has become such a defining specter for our generation of Joel Schumacher right. that we didn't want to have that be the definer of the show by titling it that. Exactly. It's kind of like the whole point of the podcast is that we want to see all the other stuff that he's done. Yeah. We don't want that to be like the anchor that everything else is circling around. Right. We want to just look at the whole career that that is a part of. Mm hmm. And we couldn't come up with a better title, so we just went with Schumacher's. <laughs> you come up with one, people. <laughs> and then we get to the interesting one, 8mm. Yes. That movie came out. Nick Cage was kind of at a high point with a few different Con Air and The Rock. So I was like really into him. Face Off. Oh, yeah. That was a literal trilogy of The Rock, Con Air, and Face Off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I have not watched this movie in a long time. I remember it being very dark. But see, this was like my senior year of high school. So like dark and depressing. Like that was like totally in my wheelhouse. So Mm -hmm. I loved this movie at the time. And I've had an interesting relationship with it. I only saw it, I want to say, in the last year or two. 
but mm-hmm. I had known about it for a long time because I collect screenplays. I'm a big fan of screen nerds. Andrew Kevin Walker, who wrote 8mm and 7, mm-hmm. is one of my favorite screenwriters to read. I just love reading stuff. And I read 8mm, I want to say back in the early 2000s. So I had mm-hmm. known the story for a long time, but it's kind of notorious for how much he hates the movie hmm. or how much he hated the making of the movie to the point where he refuses to watch the movie. And then to have that story and then finally having now seen the movie, there's going to be some interesting stuff to talk about. Okay. So yeah, and again, I did see that just a couple of years ago where my movie night group, we were like, let's just go through all of Nicolas Cage's movies. (laughs) And we did not expect that year and a half. (laughs) (laughs) Oh boy, that was an experience. And you can hear our our recounting of that on Xanadu Cinema Pleasure Down. And then we get to an interesting one, Flawless. Was that Mariah Carey? Who's in that one? No, no, no. This one no, was, this it's is... Robert De Niro and Philip Seymour Hoffman. Maybe I'm, okay. I guess I don't know this one. It's always just been kind of under the radar. It'll be an interesting one to explore. Okay, yeah. I remember the trailers from when it came out, but I never saw it. And then we get to, this is another one of the ones that he produced, Gossip. I don't think I've seen that one. I have never have. Looking at the cast and the poster, it looks like kind of one of those CW thriller dramas. Mm. I know nothing else about it, so I guess we'll be going in cold. And then there's Tigerland, which I know is a war movie with Colin Farrell. Hmm, okay. I've always heard good reviews of, but I know it never really got a wide theatrical release and I never saw it. Okay, yeah. And then there's Bad Company, the buddy cop comedy with Chris Rock and Anthony Hopkins. Huh. I remember that one being a huge bomb when it came out and critics tore it to shreds. Okay. Because that was like one of those post-Rush Hour movies. Right. Yeah, makes sense. That's an interesting combo of actors. I don't know. Apparently not a very successful one, but we'll see. Right. And then we have Phone Booth. Had you ever seen Phone Booth? No. I remember hearing a lot about it, but I never actually went and saw that one. Phone Booth, I've seen, I've read. It actually got me into Larry Cohen, who was the guy who wrote it, who, big writer back in the 50s and 60s and became this really famous guerrilla indie director in the 70s, where he would like go and shoot films on the streets of New York without a permit, where they would like literally run out of a van, shoot a scene and run back in the van (laughs) before the cops show up. I know Phone Booth goes back to Hitchcock. It was something that they were working on together. And it's something that's been flying around Hollywood for decades. Oh, wow. Okay. It's a film I remember enjoying. And I know it has a really interesting history to it that I'll definitely get into then. But yeah, if you've never seen it, I'm going to be very curious to hear your thoughts on Phone Booth. Okay. And then we get to, I don't know if it's Veronica Guerin or Guerin. I don't know. And that's one I remember the ads for when it came out, but I never saw it. Is it like a based on a true story thing? Since yeah. it's a name? Okay. And then we get to the notorious film that he had actually been trying to make since the 80s, The Phantom of the Opera. Which I think this is for both of us. I've never seen any ver. Well, I think I started the silent film and didn't finish it. <laughs> So I guess I've sort of seen some Phantom, but... I've seen like a 20-minute chunk of the silent movie. Yeah. Yeah, I've never watched a single adaptation of Phantom of the Opera. I don't even think I've listened to the soundtrack. I mean, I know some of the songs, obviously. It's hard not to absorb them. That's about all I know. I remember (laughs) it was like playing somewhere at a theater near here in the 90s, so they would have a commercial that had like a medley of all the songs that I probably have like that memorized. It's just the pieces, but not the whole thing. Yeah. So this is going to be a journey of discovery. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As Joel does, swinging a complete 180, the number 23. This is the one with Jim Carrey's in it. Jim Carrey, where he becomes obsessed with the number. Yes. I don't think I actually saw this one, even though it seemed exactly like my kind of movie. I think I missed it in theaters and then never caught up with it. I'm curious to see it because also this was Jim Carrey in his very big, let me be dramatic phase. Mm -hmm. Then we get on to Blood Creek, which is one I don't really know anything about. No, never heard of it. I know it's his horror movie. Okay. Then we get to 12, which is, I know, kind of like a, I actually don't know what at all it's about. I know it's (laughs) Emma Roberts is in it and people look vapid and sad. All right. (laughs) And then what is currently his last movie in 2011, he hasn't made a movie since, Trespass. It's another Nicolas Cage thriller, so I've seen it. Oh, okay. Nicolas Cage, Nicole Kidman, and it's a thriller. And that's all I'll tell you because there's a lot of twists to it. (laughs) Okay, gotcha. 
And then beyond that, the last thing he's directed are two episodes of the first season of the Netflix remake of House of Cards. That's a series that I've been wanting to watch mm -hmm. for a long time, and I just haven't gotten a chance to yet. I haven't kept up with it, but I know I saw the first two seasons. So I have seen these two episodes before. Okay. It's interesting that David Fincher started, and then it's like a bunch of other Hollywood directors came in, and one of the people he went to by choice was Joel Schumacher. Okay. I would love to have more stuff beyond that. I mean, Joel's still around. He still does a lot of interviews. He contributes regularly to a lot of documentaries on Hollywood and the industry. And mm. um, he's actually done a lot of documentaries on like the history of the fashion industry. And he's a very vocal out there guy. He talks a lot. Really entertaining guy. I would love to see him continue to make movies. I know he's getting pretty up there in years. Again, born 1939. Right. Yeah. God, he'd be pushing 80 right now. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe he's just retired. I don't know. But Maybe. he's still out there. Yeah. So he hasn't like made a statement one way or the other. He's just hasn't worked. I know he's had a few other films that kind of fell apart. And one thing we forgot to mention with 12 is he also has this short that's on Amazon called Man in the Mirror, mm. which we'll also be covering at some point. And, and he's had like a number of like music videos and commercials and we'll kind of slip them in as we get to them. And yeah. No, it's like his career is just kind of stalled out a bit. I mean, it's like not to the mm. point of complete self-destruction like John Carpenter. But <laughs> no. And like you said, it may just be that he's getting older yeah. and, you know, he's had a successful career, I'm sure, that he doesn't necessarily need to work now. And maybe he just wants to enjoy his retirement. Do you remember that article I sent you a while back showing that house that he has that he built for yeah. himself? That really weird eccentric house. I'm like, mm -hmm. if I were pushing 80, I would just chill out there because that is a weird, cool house. Cozy cabin in the woods. <laughs> it's this weird, bizarre, <laughs> twisted cabin, but I love it. <laughs> So that's all that we're going to be covering for Joel Schumacher. And what I'd be interested in is feel free to jump in the comments section of this episode and just kind of let us know what are your thoughts on Schumacher? What are you looking forward to us exploring? Don't spoil too much of us because, again, we haven't seen most of those films. But <laughs> right. what are you looking forward to us getting to? And what are some of the yeah. films that you especially enjoy or even hate about Joel Schumacher? Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear from people. And I'm kind of curious, too, like, did any of those names surprise you? Mm. Because I know, like, for me, I was like, wait, he did that one? He did yeah. that one. Like when you first suggested this podcast idea to me, it was like, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, we've got yeah. a lot to talk about. And that's exactly why I first had the idea because you look at his career and it's like, that's a really interesting career to talk about. Because mm -hmm. it's just such a wide variety of stuff. And a lot of them were really hits that you still, even if you've never seen it, you've heard of it. Right. You know the title and, and it left some kind of an impact. And again, so much of our generation is just like Batman and Robin. But it's like, no, there's so much more beyond that without yep. saying the bat nipples. <laughs> so I hope everyone enjoys our journey through the career of <laughs> Joel Schumacher. Yes. And now we fly off with our flared wingtip collars. <laughs> <laughs> kept warm by that lovable pattern ascot. Yes. Or a beautifully knit sweater, because he does some really great knit sweaters. Fuzzy sweaters for all. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that's Shima Cass. Anything else you want to add, Angie? Nope. Just I hope everyone uh, joins us along for the ride and enjoys it. Yeah. If you've listened to our, any of our previous shows, you might recognize some people and we'll have some new people along too. Yes. Anyways, I think that brings this episode to a close. Good night, everyone. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit shumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot dot com. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were both created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Woody Allen's The Adventures of Ford Fairlane would have actually been interesting. <laughs> oh, God. He's like a clarinet player who couldn't break into the pop industry. And he played by Woody Allen. <laughs> You're a poet and didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm imagining him starring in Hudson Hawk, too. <laughs> Why not? Do you have an, do you have an espresso? <laughs>